Okay, I'm going to call to order um, <clears throat> September 10th, 2018 um, Planning Commission meeting, Yale Spring Planning Commission meeting. Um, Donnell, or can I call the roll? I, I, I Sorry. You call the roll, it. it's okay though. <laughs> Pelzell. Here. Doden. Here. Stiles. Here. Krieger. Here. Donnell. Yes. Also present are solicitor Chris Connard, planning official Denise Swinger, and that's it. Okay. Um, so we have uh, two minutes that we're going to go over. We have the communications. We have the Bowen housing report. Are we going to do that before? The, the housing report is strictly for your. Okay just informational purposes. Um, council report, but Marianne isn't here. Um, citizens comments, so that's a time for citizens to comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Um, and then we'll go into our public hearings. Uh, we have a conditional use application for a pocket neighborhood development um, for Mania College. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight text amendments, um, and uh, then old business, any new business, and agenda planning. Um, so the minutes of August 27th, I was not there, but enough of you were. Um, <clears throat> does anyone have any uh, issues with page one. No, page two. There's only page one. Oh no, I was oh, doing the thirteenth first. Oh, you weren't here. Sorry, oh, it's sure. it's first in the. <clears throat> sorry. August thirteenth. Yeah. Yep. I'm sorry. My bad. Um, page one. Page two. Page three. Page four, page five, page six, page seven, you want to call the vote on that? Do you have a motion? I move approval oh, yeah. of the minutes of August 13th. Second. Okay. And you just voice vote will do. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All Abstain. I'm going to abstain as well. Got that. Okay, now we're doing the minutes from August 27th. Um, this was a special uh, work session on the um, uh, comprehensive land use plan. Um, it's only one page. Does anyone have any uh, additions? Okay. Um, do we have a motion to approve? I move approval of the minutes of August 27th. All second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All abstain? Abstain. All right. Um, so we have uh, everyone got the housing report. We have that. Mm -hmm. um, oh. oh, Lisa. Yeah. Do you have anything to update us? Um, do you have a council report? I don't. Well, do you want to, on the record, tell us how the um, zoning uh, change vote went? Um, the zoning change vote went um, smoothly, yeah. I think would be a way to say it. Um, I don't think there was a, a lot of uh, discussion. There was support. Denise for the reason commented. Yeah, <coughs> so it was, yeah, it was an uneventful. Strong support. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, great. Okay. Uh, we okay so 
Uh, sorry. Uh, citizens comments. So this is a time when um, anyone, citizens who want to comment on something that's not on the agenda, so not about the conditional use application or any of the text amendments may come up and um, ask questions or make a statement. Okay, hearing none. Um, <clears throat> Let's move on to the conditional use application. Um, do we, how, how do we want to work this? Is, I got it. Do you want, do I need to call? Is he on the line? They probably are. Oh, that's how that works. He calls and then we put in the numbers. So we're just getting Antioch's architect on the line so that um, he can hear us and we can hear him. Are you there? Oh. Hi, Christian. I'm, I'm Judy Kintner. I'm the clerk of council here. I'm going to let uh, the folks at the table and in the room introduce themselves so that we all know who we are. Perfect. Okay, um, I'm Rose Pelzel. I'm the chair of Planning Commission. I'm Frank Oden. I'm Planning Commission. <laughs> Susan Stiles. I'm Planning Commission. Lisa Krieger, Krieger council member, uh, alternate for Planning Commission. I'm Ted Donnell for Planning Commission. Uh, Denise Swinger, <coughs> zoning administrator for Yale Springs. Chris Connard, village solicitor. And that's everyone. Um, be nice if it's your names. You can share this. Um, so I'll go ahead so, and just yeah. kind of give an overview. Um, <clears throat> Antioch College approached, uh, unfortunately, probably last last year, maybe. Yeah, and um, wanted was interested in um, the new ordinance uh, that Planning Commission wrote the pocket neighborhood development, um, which was approved by council. Uh, this, uh, the air, the location um, on East North College Street um, was rezoned, uh, went through the, pro well, first it was replatted because it was three parcels into two, um, the larger parcel being the one where the, the location of this pocket neighborhood development would be. It's currently, um, in order to, um, use the pocket neighborhood uh, criteria in the zoning code, it has to be in a residential neighborhood. So um, it is going through the rezoning process right now. It was um, approved for rezoning at the planning commission level and at the last meeting of council, there was strong support for it as well. It'll go for a second reading at their next meeting. Um, upon uh, approval of that, it will then go into effect 30 days after. Um, this <coughs> pocket neighborhood development tonight that we are going through is a for the conditional use permit. Um, this is uh, uh, an overview uh, of what the project um, uh, intends to look like. It also will include it includes a site plan review. Um, this this project is eight units. Um, two, uh, four of those are. Uh, single family dwellings and four of those are duplexes or two family um, and that meets the criteria um, it uh, in going through the uh, criteria for the pocket neighborhood development itself uh, most um, all of the zoning requirements were met there are a couple of um, things uh, which at the end of my report I wanted to talk about later um, because we may need to get some more information on. Um, additionally, um, the Village Yellow Springs contracted with um, Choice One and had them review the uh, stormwater plan and they have some uh, additional uh, conditions for approval, which was discussed last Friday. 
with the architects um, for Antioch College and Antioch College's representatives. Um, and they were in agreement that uh, once the uh, construction plans were near completion, then we, they could come back. Uh, Johnny Burns, our public works director, would review those as well as we'll have our um, contracted engineer um, look at those storm cal water calculations again to make sure that that will work. As far as um, the design, uh, if there's any, Monica, if there's anything more you want to say about this project, now's your chance. Uh, so we have uh, Christian on the line from McLennan Design from Seattle area, and they've been involved in Can the you project. Introduce yourself? Yes, sure. I'm Monica Hasek. I'm the project manager, and I also want to introduce our project advisor, Kevin Magruder. And we have Tom Manley, president of Antioch College here. And then we also have our civil engineer, uh, Steve. Steve uh, Wild. Hi. So um, thank you all for your support in this. And I want to really especially thank Denise. Uh, she's been very supportive throughout the process and very helpful, as uh, well as Johnny and, and Judy. So the, um, the project, as mentioned, um, it's a sustainable pocket neighborhood development um, on Antioch College campus and our effort to integrate um, the college with the community um, to support some of the um, local issues we have around housing. Um, and we, we are doing that with a sustainable lens, and that's why we have um, contracted McLennan Design. As I mentioned, they've been involved in the project um, for a couple years from just the original concept of what we called uh, the Antioch College Village. So this is a pilot project. Um, so a little mini piece of the larger uh, vision that we hope to see happen. And we're really happy to be the very first um, pocket neighborhood development, you know, here in, in Yellow Springs um, to propose this. Um, is really exciting time for the village and the college. Anything else? So um, <clears throat> there's eight units, and um, as I mentioned before, um, I, I think I kind of want to open it up to the Planning Commission members for any thoughts they have about um, what they saw in my report, or if they have any further questions about what I reviewed or what the um, contracted engineer reviewed. Ted, you want to start? Well, I have questions. I don't think I have any comments regarding the, um, the review. I think the report's actually pretty comprehensive. Um, I think that the plan itself, the idea itself, is fantastic. I support, absolutely support pocket neighborhoods. Um, I do have questions. Um, I don't know how you want to go about doing these questions, if you want to just everybody have at it. and. Hopefully, get some answers and then move on. Yeah, I think that would work. Do you think? Yeah, we have, think we so. have the architect yeah. on the phone, so. Yeah. Um, the first uh, part of what I want to address is the village has been um, really committed to reestablishing any alleys that we have. Uh, we think they're assets. Uh, in the past, they weren't considered that, and they were abandoned. Um, a lot of them for no good reason. Um, this is an opportunity, I think, to work with the village to reestablish that alley. Uh, and so when I looked at this and I didn't see any um, access from the parking area to the alley, or I didn't see any direct parking off the alley that might be the western side of the development directly for parking, I wondered why. Um, and then I wondered. Um, how the treatment between the walking path and the alley was going to be treated. There would be a barrier, um, or why not use the alley as part of a pedestrian way? But that was question one. <clears throat> question two, well, I think, do you want to go through questions and then come back? Um, that's a good idea. Or do you want yeah. to go question okay, so. answer? Um, I think we should. You can continue your questions, yeah. Um, the second thing uh, regarding some kind of an, um, how this overlaps into the village, I've always felt that 
Um, North College with a 75-foot right-of-way is ridiculous. I mean, it seems like you could land an airplane on South College, um, and it's, it's really unfriendly. You know, so the connection between uh, the pocket neighborhood and what's future development across the street seems like it's, it's, there's an immediate barrier there. And so to me, it seems like the village could somehow work with the development partner to establish a tree boulevard or something down the center of that to break up the sun, to break up mm. the heat island, um, do things like that, and then work into that a pedestrian, obvious pedestrian crosswalk, um, but really slow it down. You know, slow down traffic, use traffic calming devices to make that much more pedestrian. Um, <clears throat> the third part of what I was going to talk about was um, there's a little bit of a conflict between the plans and the building elevations with regards to stormwater. Um, on, one of, on a couple of the plans, you show rain barrels but you don't show any way to divert the water off of the building and down the side, the panel, basically the metal panels that run ground to ground. Uh, but there's no way to, to divert that water, collect that water off the roof and get it to the rain barrels. And I'm curious how that's gonna be done. Um, also, with regards to stormwater, <clears throat> the units that are doubled don't show any means by which to divert stormwater as those two roof planes come together, they just come together. Uh, obviously, there's got to be some architectural treatment on how the how that water is going to be diverted. And then without um, downspouts or some way of collecting that from those crickets, it's just going to be a lot of volume of water that's not addressed um, in any of the plans or elevations. Um, the third thing that I would Four. Four, <laughs> I'm four already? I'm sorry. Um, the fourth thing that I wanted to address was I think that to me this project of all the projects that we could have it has significance on a lot of levels. Um, one that the village is so committed to pocket neighborhood density, high density, um, and two the village is really committed to seeing how the college can integrate seamlessly into the community, especially if the college is considering shrinking its footprint and what does that vocabulary look like and how does it really make Yellow Springs identifiable um, from the college. Um, and in my mind, I just have a question. Um, if I walk on the sidewalk and I'm walking down the sidewalk, the side elevation of this, these structures is solid, basically a solid wall of metal that addresses the sidewalk with a bump out of wood. And the wood vocabulary matches the same wood vocabulary of the dumpster, which I think is just, I'm, the question that I have is how do you think that that vocabulary of street elevation addresses the character and the eclecticness of the village? You know, um, that concerns me a lot because I think that it's creating almost a, an island effect of this is what the college is going to do, but it really doesn't seamlessly work into the neighborhood. Um, uh, question, are you saying that's from the uh, front uh, East North College, right uh, looking towards? You're walking on the sidewalk. If you're walking along the sidewalk. The south elevation of the two units that are closest to the sidewalk. And those were my questions. Okay. Can I ask Christian if he? Yeah. Christian, did you did you hear those questions? I uh, yes. Uh, I I wasn't sure if you wanted to begin addressing them uh, from committee member to committee member or get them all. It, it, it would be easier for me to be able to address uh, questions per committee member, um, just so I can make sure I keep track of them all as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think I think you can um, go ahead and, and respond to uh, Ted's questions. All right, um, so please forgive me that the, every once in a while the phone cuts out a little bit, so I may have missed uh, 
a couple of words here or there, but I, I believe I caught the, the question for the most part. Um, so beginning with uh, question one, uh, regarding the alleyway engagement uh, and the opportunities that are there or that were uh, felt up and missed. Um, so personally, I, I'm a huge fan of alleyways, their ability to kind of uh, cut down the scale of a, of a residential block or a city block and make it where it's easier for a pedestrian to pass through the, uh, the, the larger context. We were looking at, at this as trying to facilitate more of a pedestrian uh, engagement. So we weren't wanting to pull the, the vehicles all the way through or have them accessing the alleyway uh, directly. We're wanting to actually try to minimize the amount of vehicle usage since the, uh, the eventual homeowners for, for these units are are looking to minimize their, their footprint. So instead we were trying to engage more of the pedestrian and other modal uh, means of utilizing that. We didn't want to put sideways and pathways into the alleyway because you know that, that's not the property that we're allowed to, to be working with. But we did want to carry this meandering pathway all the way around the perimeter of the, the property. So along the west and the north ends of the property, you'll see that, that meandering five foot wide uh, concrete pathway that, that helps take advantage of that naturally kind of kept open space that is the, the city alleyway. Um, so if, if vehicles are accessing it just for immediate access or if it ends up becoming some kind of a, a greenscape, these pathways help to provide eyes and, and feet within those spaces, uh, taking, uh, again, taking advantage of the, the fact that these are kind of maintained open spaces. So it's, it's a nice kind of relationship in that regard. <clears throat> Um, addressing the question number two at the roadway sizing. So we we absolutely agree. The uh, 75 foot wide right of way of the East North College Street is a very generous size. Um, there is a, a larger master plan discussion that, that's, that's been had with Antioch College where if they, if they choose to engage in additional uh, projects that will be along North College Street, but there be an opportunity to have a dialogue and, and work with the village to redevelop that, that streetscape and introduce means of slowing down traffic, engaging with bike lanes, engaging with uh, on-street parking, and making it one of those really nice, uh, vibrant streetscapes where it's not, not just a, a moat between one block to another, but um, a, a, a nice kind of active multimodal uh, pathway through this, this neighborhood and leading the, along the edge of the, uh, the college. So that way, you know, everyone wins. The, the village wins, the residents in the neighborhood win, and the, the college has this, this great kind of uh, front uh, front doorstep, essentially, uh, or one of its many doorsteps. Um, addressing the question number three, elevations and, and in particular the, uh, the gutters and how the rainwater is captured and directed to the uh, rain barrels. Definitely a fair point. Um, I've actually been putting some finishing touches on the details as to how that gutter system fits in. Um, I'm sure some, some members of the committee can be well aware. It's a little bit tricky when you are folding a roofing material around the corner and then you're now introducing the gutter. Uh, so that was a little more finessing, but uh, we're, we're not intending to just shed the water directly off of the roof onto the ground plane because there's opportunities to be capturing that water and utilizing it for 
the landscaping with the rain barrels, and then we want to be mindful of to how that's being fed into the, the larger stormwater uh, strategy. So those those gutters were not shown on the the, the elevations at the time of this uh, submission. And on that note, same with the uh, the method in which the valleys of the duplexes are handling the, the shedding of the water. Absolutely agree that we've actually been developing the details as to how the cricketing for within those valleys occurred to make sure that you know, we're, we're not capturing water in the middle and it's just sitting there. Um, so those, those details have been developed and, and definitely have been mindful of it. Um, in regards to question number four, the street frontage, um, we want to have all the units engage the what's been termed the plaza, the the ident readily identified common space for this pocket neighborhood. So they're all opening up onto the space. But one of the things that we did was we we spread them open, the, the units open to kind of lay out. So that's why you have this triangular. Or, uh, organization of the units around this common space so that way the common space becomes more of an engagement with that street frontage. The units themselves have that recessed front wall to create a covered um, entry deck that that has that response. So there's a couple of rendering uh, that were provided in the package where you actually do get to see a bit of what what would be like to be walking along that front road or that street frontage and be looking up into this little community of this little uh, pocket neighborhood development. So different spots along that street frontage, that sidewalk there, as you're walking along, you're going to be seeing this dynamic stepping of these units and the trees and everything. Um, I agree there's the side of the units are the main face of the unit to the uh, the street or the front two units which are the two bedroom uh, detached homes those we've softened the edge with the instead of having to be the uh, standing seam metal roof that's wrapping down the sides the portion that is closest to the street is the uh, six inch cedar uh, horizontal site that helps soften it but along that side also are a series of windows that start to kind of break it up and bring in that human scale and we're, we're wanting to be careful because we don't want to provide too much transparency into the unit because we need to be mindful of the privacy of the residents within the units uh, that they're they're feeling as though they are within their homes and and that is a bedroom that is closest uh, to that street but fortunately we do have that that great 20 foot mandatory setback uh, that the code requires that we're then able to landscape and, and develop into uh, a nice buffer to create uh, a set of gradients uh, between the, the public sidewalk and right away to the private residence um, to further engage kind of the the larger neighborhood as a whole we've also included the area that's been termed the gardens um, we did not calculate that as part of the common space for the pocket neighborhood development but that is kind of a, a space that's helping to break up just the sidewalk and then suddenly you're on a pathway and then you're in the property, but rather creating this little plaza area that's going to be a little more active and the, the residents will have that ability to have that be a, a transition zone to kind of invite the sidewalk into uh, the community instead of just, say, putting up a wall and, and locking it off and saying, you know, this is your space and this is ours. We were looking for opportunities to bring the, the passerby's eyes into the community, see the, the engagement between the units 
she wore another uh, across this common uh, common space of the plaza, and to have a, a great kind of front step to the open space as a whole for neighbors to be able to come and engage and be invited into this this pocket neighborhood within this larger residential uh, context. <clears throat> All right. Do you? Mm -hmm. um, Ted, do you have any? Oh, I'll wait. You'll you'll wait. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anyone else have any questions for the architect? Well, I guess I want to follow up on. I guess the issue with the water barrel, um, because looking at the pictures. I can't, I, I can't see where there could be a gutter. And I wasn't clear on, you said you were thinking about that, but I wasn't clear on, that are you going to use a gutter or not? How are you going to direct the water into the water barrel? Then I had a question actually on the water barrels, because I noticed, I, I believe from the picture, that it looked like each unit will have two water barrels, 55 gallon water barrels. And so I was just wondering, what are they going to be used for? I know they can be used for landscaping, um, but I wondered, because that's a lot of water for landscaping. I use a water barrel myself, and I also know that when, like, a day like uh, we've had this weekend, it is overflowing, water coming <laughs> out because, I, you know. <laughs> so I, I, you know, so that's a question I have. What, are, what is all the water going to be used for? And are you doing gutters or not? And if you're not doing gutters, how will you direct that water into the water barrel? Okay. Uh, yeah, no, uh, a, again, great questions, uh, great points. The, so the rain barrels are meant to be capturing water for when it does get a bit drier. The larger stormwater uh, strategy and, and uh, approach is to utilize the rain gardens and the bioswells and infiltration to help take care of the, uh, the, the larger um, storm water concerns, but the rain barrels are really to capture the water uh, and be able to store it for when it, it does get a bit drier and, and there's that interest in irrigating the, uh, the planters. So when you look at the, the site plan, um, which is on sheet A101, the rain barrels have been paired up next to the these uh, planter boxes that are at the ends of each of the decks. So that's an opportunity for the homeowners to have uh, whatever particular types of plants that they, they may be growing, but then directly adjacent to their units, they, if they're, they so wish, they, they can develop the landscape a little bit further. We were carving out and defining these, these direct garden opportunities at the ends of the decks where we can do a raised uh, planter box essentially that's at the level of the deck but brings it up to a nice uh, tenable uh, height for for someone to be working with and then they have the, the convenience of the uh, stored uh, rainwater within the barrels directly there but the, the larger issue of water uh, management on the site is being dealt with with the rain gardens. Um, for the, the question of the uh, gutters as a whole, um, yes, we're, we're including actually half round uh, gutters at the, along the edges of each of the units, um, along with cricketing in the valley of the duplexes to lead out to the gutters that are at the ends of the unit. Right. Um, <clears throat> I just had a follow-up question. Yeah. Are, are those um, rain barrels then, are they self-contained? They're enclosed with just piping that goes into them? How, how does, I mean, they're not open. No, no they're not open. Um, they, they would be self-contained enclosed with, a, with the uh, spigot on them to be able to access the water. Um, we're, we're always concerned about having any kind of open water 
elements uh, because there's always the issue of mosquitoes or anything with standing water, so they are are uh, enclosed. Okay. Um, and then the overflow would be then channeled into the landscape and to the rain gardens. Okay. What about in the winter time for freezing? You don't want 55 gallon um, barrel full of frozen water. <laughs> Yeah, no, that that's a definitely an excellent, uh, excellent point. Uh, that would be more of an operational standpoint. So the the homeowner, you know, we're we're not talking about uh, insulated rain barrels. So that is a, a very valid issue. It would be upon the homeowner to make sure to be draining their barrels uh, leading into the winter to make sure that they don't end up having any kind of. Uh, Freeze damage done, John. I have a question. Hi, this is Lisa talking. Um, I guess it's more of a it's a design and kind of flow um, question. I I appreciate on one hand that the parking is all you know over to one side in terms of of creating that lovely plaza space. Um, but on the other hand, um, I'm imagining that I live in the unit that's the furthest away from the parking, and I'm imagining I'm getting a new refrigerator, or I'm imagining that I'm getting a couch. Or so and none of these lovely pictures show people walking through with washing machines on dollies. And having lived in in very urban settings, you know where people have to walk through with stuff. I know that it can be kind of an obstruction. Um, there isn't access from behind, like from an alley where large deliveries could come in to those um, units that are the furthest away from the parking. So I, I'm just wondering what some of the conversation was about, about getting stuff in and out of those units that are the furthest from the parking and the impact no, on the walking a, space. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I I live in I've lived in apartments for many many years. I've been in some great apartments where they had that forethought and made sure that the hallways were wide enough that you could actually get yourself a through. And then there were other ones where the landlord had to buy us a new box spring because it was so poorly planned and designed that there was no way to get a regular box spring of a queen size bed into the uh the space um it, it it's a valid concern and something that has to be thought out of um one of the things that we're we're providing is the five foot wide concrete paths which helps with the accessibility standpoint but also gives a nice clean pathway for people to be able to move heavier things or strollers or themselves without having to worry about, you know, stepping off the edge um, or kind of rolling their, their ankles or anything, but they have a clear unobstructed pathway. Um, additionally, the landscaping around, the, especially the perimeters and close to the, uh, the back decks are all uh, kind of a natural native grasses and meadowland, uh, hardier plants that again are indigenous and, and native to the areas. So it provides a, a non-obstructed pathway where you know for that initial moving day in, if people if if they choose to kind of cut through there, they can easily get that large one-off item through that space without having to mow through, say, a huge hedge or a, or a holly bush or something of that nature. The, both the front and the back of the units have been laid out with a large, generous deck that has a full-size three-foot-wide door, so it gives uh, nice clearance to be able to move something into the space, but even thinking from the exterior, approach uh there's let's see the back deck has stairs that are four foot ten inches wide and the front deck has stairs are ten feet wide so the those spaces are 
nice, wide, and generous, so that way you have the, the ability to maneuver and get the furniture pieces in and out uh, more readily. The, uh, the fridge, in case of, say, a new fridge or a new dishwasher or something, that would be going in through the front door. And again, we have that nice, clear, uh, five-foot-wide pathway that the dolly can roll right along it turn, go right up to the stairs, and then be uh, moved up the stairs by the, the movers to get uh, directly into the unit and right into the, the kitchens. Thank you. Uh, one other question, you know, I noticed the two fire lanes. I keep focusing on this one unit that's the, you know, furthest back in the, in the corner. Have we, uh, has it, has it been reviewed that that's great access in the unlikely event that there's a fire the, in that the, one unit? The two fire lanes that are, are tagged in yellow in mm -hmm. the report were actually from Colin. Okay. Um, and uh, which I think they added one of the two. I'm not sure they actually put it in the exact location that Colin had requested it, but we will okay. ask for that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that in the called out in the agenda just to highlight um, so we we did it uh, putting the dash field around the uh, the two locations was provided from the fire department uh, comment the there's a little bit of a, a folly on my part the note that calls out those two areas on sheet uh, a101 has two arrows coming from it, but the arrows are coming from opposite ends of that note. So it looks like it's only pointing to the one that's off of the public right away. Oh, but yeah. there's actually an arrow that's coming okay, off the back so of it that's pointing to the one that's on the private property as well. Okay. Sorry about that. That's, oh, okay. that's a clarity or clarity I, issue. I kind part. of thought that was defining where you were putting the, yeah, I didn't see that. <coughs> Does that answer your question? Thank you. Ted, do you want to? Yeah, I want to follow up on something if I could. This is Ted again. Um, getting back to the character, um, Yellow Springs is probably, well, it, as far as I'm concerned, it is the most eclectic mix of architecture of any community I've ever been in. Um, the villagers themselves are the most diverse, open-minded, um, across the board, just eclectic, very individualized people. Um, and together, the village forms a very neat space. It's, it makes it something that is uncharacteristic of most communities, particularly when it comes to places like Florida, where you have gated communities and all the or any apartment complex where you have all the buildings that look the same, or condo complex that has all the buildings that look the same. They're all laid out in this nice symmetrical order, and everybody <coughs> loses their identity the moment that they walk into the space. And <clears throat> I think that the massing <coughs> of the gray metal that comes to the street and addresses the south elevation, although <coughs> I understand the sustainability side of it, looks to me more like a barracks than it does um, a residential community, particularly an intimate little pocket neighborhood. And I don't know how you can, how you can give me an answer that um, really addresses how that fits into the character of the village. <coughs> that um, yeah, it's, it's always a bit of a, of a challenge. I, I definitely agree with you of, of being able to give an answer when it comes to uh, design aesthetic to when we're, we're all individuals, so we all have kind of a, a different view or a different perspective on what we may find to be a, a telling or, or not. Um, and that that's one of the great things about architecture is, is that there is 
you know, this rich variety and tapestry out there. And heaven forbid we ever go someplace that is a, just a monolithic, constant cookie cutter layout of the exact same thing. We, we can see that with some of the massive subdivisions that are in Southern California. We've all seen those photos where it's just the exact same thing. Um, one thing that that does stand out is when you get down to a really fine scale of say eight or 12 little units and when they're at the right tangible scale where we're talking about you know 900 square feet or so they become these little cottage elements I've been to parts of areas like out on the Catalina stuff where you see the old <laughs> say Kwanzaa hut style uh, architecture from the old military base that was out there. And the way that they've been integrated into the landscape, the way that the community embraced them and, and defined the space around them, they become these great little elements and they have a relationship with each other and they are a community as a result. It's, you know, architecture and design is, is always in the eye of the holder. And good design will facilitate that opportunity with the right kind of orientation, the right kind of layout, and the right kind of access and engagement with the larger context as a whole. Last thing we want to do is create some kind of gated community where it creates barriers between the, the, the larger neighborhood as a whole and the people that are living within this little pocket neighborhood development, which is are the driving idea as to how this was laid out in the first place, where the focal point becomes a shared element between the, the units opening up on that, that plaza, that common space, which could have been rectilinear, it, it could have been very inward facing with kind of a, a circular element in the center and the units turned their back completely on the, the community um, as a result. Or we can take the approach that we did, which is more of a triangular configuration. So the units are opening up onto the shared space. And the third side of that triangle is the community as a whole. The, the community of Yale Springs sharing that, that view into this community and having that direct unobstructed access to that common space as well. So that way, <coughs> It is about the, the large community uh, beyond. These are very small, kind of efficient homes. So there are certain things that, that are being taken into consideration in that regard. Um, standardizing and creating a, a nice, clean module so that way the price can be kept down low. It can be more affordable for the, the future homeowners. And that way they can enjoy their spaces more, not, not having to pay a huge uh, mortgage as a result. The other aspect is they're, they're very, very high on the sustainable standpoint. So that means, you know, we're being more mindful as to where we are creating openings within the facade to allow for natural light to come in and views to be kind of going back and forth, but also utilizing a lot of opaque surfaces in order to build up that insulation, that R value, to make sure that they're they're not driving up huge electrical bills as well. So it's, it's always a, a bit of a, a challenge striking that, that nice, that perfect balance, but we're feeling on our end that, that we have, you know, struck a, a a balance where these these eight units are creating something that does generate a great rich community that isn't inward looking but rather is engaging the community as a whole and, and again buying them in by sharing that third edge. Okay, so um Susan, it sounds it looks like <laughs> Well I, I just wanted to say that Aesthetically, I love it. I think they're very attractive. So I don't have the concerns that Ted has. But I also wanted to ask Denise, are we looking at design right now or are we simply looking at other issues? And we look at, yeah, we look at design. We're as, looking oh, at design we, because it, uh, we want to make sure that 
<clears throat> from a design perspective for an entire development. And when we do that for like a single family, you know, it, not as much, but still, mm -hmm. I always look to make sure it's architecturally integrated, sure. uh, at least within, uh, within the, the unit itself, so that you don't do a, an add-on that looks not similar to what <laughs> is there. But when you, when you are looking at an entire development, yes, you're, you're looking at. Well, I, I find them attractive. And I do know that when we were coming up with um, the pocket neighborhood, that one of the things we did talk about was that there should be um, within that pocket neighborhood that they should go together. You know, that there should be. <laughs> yes. And I think and these <clears throat> are very well integrated. And it's a, it's a unique, you know, it's something very unique. And so I like it. Yeah, I like them as well. Uh, and if I'm looking at the, if you look at the whole distance from the street, the houses themselves are actually maybe a third of the whole, of the whole mm -hmm. street length there, so it's really not that much space. And, and if I think about, you know, when I'm walking my dogs through my neighborhood, mm -hmm. passing the houses, I'm seeing a higher percentage of garage door on the fronts of houses than what this is presenting from the street view. So I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't share the, I understand the, the concern, but I don't think it'll be a problem. I think there's enough green space there that'll be broken up. Yeah. I'd like to add a little bit of context. Can you come up? Sure. <laughs> this is Monica. I'd like to add a little bit of context to it as well in that, um, remember, this is a pilot project, and so we took one element of the larger vision, which um, would be across the street, and so the one element is the cottage, you know, these, these cottages together. But then across the street, what we're hoping to see in the future would be a few more cottages, then a different style of architecture, townhouses, and then a different style of architecture, apartment buildings. So this would be all across the street, and then it would start to talk to each other, right? We would maybe see that repeat of the style again across across the street, and then start to give a little bit more of that eclectic um, feel that you were speaking of, Ted. So that's actually, I, I was going to ask about that, the next step of this project. Um, if it sort of, in my mind, the unifying thing about housing in Yellow Springs is that it is all different. Um, and so I don't mind the particular aesthetics of, of this um, development, but I'd be worried about the next phase only carrying forward in the same aesthetic vein. Right. So you're saying that there would be a couple cottages, but there wouldn't be, you know, the, a, a huge one of these or something no, like that right, as a right. single-family home. And of course, it's just in the master planning phase, you know, real concept, but it, it, what we have so far is um, just a small little cluster, maybe four of those cottages across the street, and then, again, there's townhouses and an apartment building, and then a um, community house, which is a, the larger vision of this co-housing, um, where it would be um, a shared kitchen and um, common space, you know, where you could have large gatherings. So so the people across the street that live in these tiny homes <coughs> then could be a part of the community in this larger. So again, that's the phase two, but it's um, a tiny little repeat of what we're seeing here, you know, but again, a mix of different types of materials and um, different scales and sizes of buildings. Have, have these kinds of units been built anywhere else in the country? Not that I'm aware of. What do you say, Christian? Uh, these particular sites. Um, right, these particular there cottages. Are, there's like cousins of them, not necessarily in the U.S., but uh, in parts of Scandinavia, there, there's types of units that kind of look like this that you can find that make great little uh, pocket communities. It is kind of harkening back to a point that was raised. Yeah, I. Absolutely agree. If we were to go with, say, 100 of these units, it would get incredibly oppressive. It, it would just become so mundane. The, the beauty of having this, this rhythm of them is that it's on a very small scale, and that's why with the larger master plan, it is, it's 
going with multiple different typologies and also acknowledging the fact that not everyone wants to live in the exact same type of space mm -hmm. too. Um, for some, other things are more important to them and for others, they, they need to have that completely detached individual unit while others want to live in kind of a little bit more closer proximity with townhomes or say in a, an apartment building itself. Uh, for the construction type that these buildings are going to be utilizing, um, yeah, there, there, there are other houses that have utilized the, the methods in the U.S. Um, and actually some of the uh, manufacturers that were, we've been working with and developing some of the details of the, uh, the wall systems have been a part of the Ohio uh, economy for past 35 years. So there, there is existence of, of houses that represent different parts of what these homes as a whole are bringing together to create this particular neighborhood and, and its particular kind of vibe and benefits and, and qualities. All right. Thank you. Not sure if that really answered the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did. <laughs> As I look at the, you know, the drawings, I do have to keep reminding myself, this is 0.9 acres. It's really small. Yes. You know, yeah. it's really small. There's a lot going on, but it's it not is. very big. And I think that helps me to be, because I agree they do look like barracks, but it, it could, um, there are moderns in the, in the village, mm -hmm. you know. They're kind of unusual that there's moderns, but there, there are some. And I think e either one of these uh, triangular sides could have been one ginormous modern house. Yeah. You know, when you think about the amount of land that they occupy, yeah. so I think that that's what I have to keep reminding myself, it's the scale. Um, I have just a question about the, the, the green space areas, um, you know, and looking at the all of the plantings and things and and maybe I ha didn't see in this in the CCNRs but I mean that is a lot to manage as far as meadows and um, a lot of flowering perennials uh, so I mean you know I guess that's a good thing because they're not having to annually replant but uh, any thoughts on how that's going to be maintained, all of that greenery? Yeah, so one of the things that we did with the selection of the, the greenery is we we have a biologist that we partner with, and they he went through, identified indigenous uh, species and, and plants that will, that would naturally grow in the region around Yellow Springs. So that way it helps cut down on the amount of actual maintenance work that would be need, needed to do to take care of the, the greenscape. No matter what, there's gonna have to be some maintenance done. Uh, but that helps already bring down the bar quite a bit. The, the other aspect of it is by selecting local native species, which I know Yale Springs is also very concerned about um, not inviting in any kind of invasive species or anything of that nature. Uh, we're also facilitating opportunities for pollinator pathways to help uh, facilitate uh, food and habitat for the local uh, fauna that, that's found within the area. And, and so that's why you see a number of different flowering plants. Uh, uh, a fair number of these plants, um, especially in the areas that have been des designated as uh, the uh, meadow mm -hmm. uh, type or meadow typology, those are actually seed late. This late. So it, when they're being planted out, there will be some that are distributed normally, but then there will be a fair amount that are going to be seed mixes that get distributed and they'll grow naturally and it gives a more rich uh, biodiverse planting uh, composition for, for the local animal life to be able to, you know, have what they need. So 
So, mm, that also makes it low maintenance. Lower Martha, maintenance. Do you want to answer the question about maintenance? The cow, cow abuse? And I, I, this, Christian, this is Chris Connard, the village solicitor. I have a question as part of that as well, which is the responsibility for maintenance. Mm -hmm. That's because what I'm it, because it's not clear that the homeowners or the, the association, because mm -hmm. I have another question mm -hmm. about that too, mm -hmm. uh, would be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is something yeah, that we. Yeah, so that part I would definitely defer to Monica with the CCR and those requirements. So that is definitely something that we want to um, make sure is clear in our um, established homeowners association that who ultimately is responsible for, for that. And if it's not clear here now, um, we will continue to work on the details of that draft um, because we understand that is definitely the concern of the village that who will maintain this property and, and what will it look like when it starts to, to really fill in and, and grow. Um, so yes, that's something that needs to be um, detailed out in our CCRs. It, and I can, address, I can address that to the, the Planning Commission from, from my perspective. Um, when, when you are ready to, to move beyond the design and the other aspects of it, I have some comments regarding potential conditions that you might want to put on any approval. Okay. So when you're ready for that, let me know. <laughs> so do we want to do um, the uh, public Comments. Well, I, and everybody here is I finished. With I this. just wanted to make one comment about the plantings, because I am a master gardener and I'm one of the people who maintain the women's park, Thank and you. it's all native. But I have to say it takes a lot of work. Yes. Because those weeds will keep. You know, if you planted all weeds, you wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Do we even need to plant weeds? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your work, Susan. I see you there working. <laughs> It can be fun. Yeah. yeah. It's a job. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree on that. The, the nice thing about going with native species is that it brings down that bar in the amount of maintenance that needs to be done, mm -hmm. but it's the difference between no maintenance and low maintenance. Yes. And mm -hmm. Anyone that tells you no maintenance is definitely uh, selling you something. Yeah. Um, the low maintenance aspect, I mean, we're still dealing with a site that is not its native natural site. The, the hand of man has definitely touched it in different ways. It's the context of the city around, the introduction of different invasive species, weeds, and stuff like that. There, there will still be some maintenance that will be required. Um, our goal is to, to pick species and strategies that will help make that in easier task and also make sure we're not contributing to the problem down the road by introducing some other species that's going to be a, a problem for you know all our neighbors in the community in a different way thank you okay um how, how do you want to proceed do we want to uh, have well, okay, his so questions or do we want to uh, open uh, it up well there well, um, i think it would be a good idea to have one more round of basically design questions and then go to the context of the covenants, restrictions, conditions, and things like that. Okay. There's a couple other things that I'd like to throw on the table. We're getting to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I have one other question <coughs> regarding the um, adjacent lot that presently is a broken up asphalt parking lot. Um, does this project at all uh, touch on any improvements to get rid of that lot and at least make it mobile and less of an eyesore than the college property? Since you've got equipment there. The street? No, right no, next no. door. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, next door. is there actually um, yeah. on that? Yeah. Partial. Partial. Christian, have you addressed that at yeah. all? Yeah. So there, there is uh, so that uh, existing kind of abandoned parking area does extend on to this project site um, so in in the existing conditions plan to c002 sheet um, we're removing the portion that is on the site but the the portion that's not on this site immediately um, so it's on the neighboring lot 
Lot 3A, um, that would still remain until that lot is ready to be to proceed, and then at that time, um, the remainder of that that pavement would be dealt with. Ted, I, I um, hear your question, and I, I do agree that we could consider the aesthetics on that smaller piece, which is going to remain zoned um, educational. We don't have a plan at the moment to develop that piece, um, but I hear you in the um, the aesthetics of that concrete pad there. Well, the and economies it, of the scale, if you yeah. have, you're disrupting 95% of the adjacent property and to not take a track hoe or backhoe out there right. for an hour and a half and get rid of the asphalt yeah. on that seems pretty irresponsible. I think that's worth considering. Well, also, butterfly garden. without well, access through the alley to Livermore Street, you know, it seems like a, a wasted opportunity to not connect the walkways through the back of the property to Livermore Street. I mean, mm. right? Like, mm. here. if people mm -hmm. are either, either people are going to be walking directly across the old asphalt or around through the alley that's not really maintained or they will be going around on the sidewalk which is just you know if i were living in one of these um more western units i would you know to go downtown probably want to take livermore street mm -hmm. um rather than go up to 68 and to go around that field is actually pretty large to go around mm -hmm. like seems like going through the back way, especially because the, the, the Antioch does own that piece of land, mm -hmm. it seems irresponsible really to, mm -hmm. to not only leave it sort of needing to be demolished, but also not using it um, in a creative way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have um, design questions? Um, I would like to make a quick little statement regarding the um, the aesthetic. Um, to, to not misunderstand where I'm coming from, our responsibilities on this board are to think about communi the community of Yellow Springs, not the Antioch community, as much as we love the Antioch community, right? But our responsibility as a board is to represent the citizens of Yellow Springs. And the questions that I'm posing are questions because they're somewhat outlined in our zoning code for intent of what we want to see as a community and what we want to see in, in any new development opportunity. So if we don't ask these questions and put them on public record that we ask these questions, but just simply said, we love this and here you go, we're going to get lambasted in the next hearing that we have over some other development that none of us like, right? And I want to tell you that I love this design, personally, as an architect. I like everything about this. I think that it's really fitting. I think that the idea that this thing can fit into a master plan of similar vocabularies and address scales the way they are is very well done. but. I still have to ask these questions, and I don't want to feel like I'm the bad guy, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, I have to because I think that it protects everybody up here and it protects everybody here, and particularly when we have to hear other hearings. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to be able to say these mm -hmm. questions to that next developer. And, and we appreciate that for this project and future projects. <laughs> it means a lot. I mean, I obviously like pocket neighborhoods. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so we're going to move into the um, <clears throat> sort of more onto your recommendations and the well, conditions I, that I, we're putting I on think, it. Well, I think we probably need to review this, his review of the CCNRs because that might have some conditions that will be added to my conditions. Okay. Uh, everybody ready for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, recognizing that the, the the covenants, the declarations were a draft. Um, I've kind of got uh, 10 things that, that caught my attention. Um, 
the list isn't as bad as it sounds. Uh, the first is is that there's a reference in the covenants that the owners will th these are leasehold interests. Is that correct? Uh, so the the individuals will be not be buying. I thought that they were buying the structure, but not the land. That's correct. That's correct. So, okay. So you you but you're going to define that as a leasehold interest, but if, if effectively it's going to be a some certain a purchase of that lease, a lump sum purchase of the leasehold interest. Okay. Um, th there are a couple things in here that that uh, that were in the the draft of the covenants that. Uh, make reference to garbage containers, if any, fuel containers uh, for home heating oil and other things, that, that, and then fences. And the fe fence concept seems antithetical to what a pocket neighborhood would be. Um, there's also on, uh, uh, with animals, there's no livestock, limit of two dogs, but no limits on cats. Um, I, I, you know, we've, we've had some issues with people getting carried away with uh, with cats and, and other types of animals. Um, there's a reference to parking and on-street parking. Uh, I, I don't know how that would fit into the, the, the whole design piece when we've got dedicated parking for the residents. And I assume, looking there, that there I counted 12 spaces, I think. So there is some contemplation of guest parking. Um, I, this is not a surprise because it's still an evolving document, but we don't know how many directors would be on the, uh, the association board. Um, we don't know at this point what the assessed amount would be for the, the, the homeowner or the, the, the dwellers uh, of the units. Um, and this is one that I do think is significant. Um, under the current draft of the covenants, it allows for the directors by a 75% vote to terminate the association. And I've got a real problem with that. Uh, because again, that's antithetical to what this idea of this kind of collective living environment where everybody who lives there will participate and contribute to the cost of sustaining the environment that they're in. Um, and so all of that said is, um, that's a long way to say this. My recommendation would be as part of the conditions that, that uh, this, if the Planning Commission does approve the permit, is that uh, the governance documents, which would include the, the declarations, the covenants, I'm not so much worried about the articles, but if we're going to go through it, I'd like to take a look at them along with the uh, code of regulations and the, the well, technically bylaws and code of regulations are the same thing, but including the, uh, the, um, the government's document uh, be approved, subject to approval by the village solicitor and the village manager for that matter, but just however you want to say that. Um, I'm not anticipating that there would be any inherent conflict from that review. It would certainly be collaborative, but um, this, the, given the fact that there's not a, a lot of body of, of history out there, um, and while we can anticipate how this will play out in the short term, I'm more concerned about 10, 15, 20 years from now uh, how this will impact the village, and, and I certainly have an obligation to consider the long-term impact uh, to the best that we can when uh, reviewing all of this. I just had it. There were just a couple little typo kinds of things which we could probably talk on the phone later about that were just didn't. It, it referenced uh, individual mailboxes and it has to be a cluster mailbox. It doesn't mention the parking lot, it mentions like garages, and we need to clean that up. Um, and then probably put something in there uh, in the common elements of that parking lot as well. Um, the, other, the only other thing I can think of that I saw that um, for solar, um, the village does require a solar interconnection agreement um, for those individual solar panels. Um, so do you want to go on with your recommendations or should we open it up? I've said all I need. Mine were, okay. were concepts of what I want Planning Commission to be aware of and why, um, and certainly let, let Antioch and is the applicant know what my concerns were. Um, and so I don't have anything definitive, substantive to say in terms of what the resolution is. Okay. Judy, how do I do this again? 
Uh, you go ahead and open a public hearing. Okay, I'm going to open a public hearing. Um, any uh, citizens who'd like to come up and uh, please speak your name. Uh, we'll have three minutes. Uh, good evening. My name is Roger Huff. I'm an Antioch College alum. I'm a frequent participant in the college's quarterly volunteer work project, so I've been getting down to Yellow Springs for my residence in Chicago a fair amount. And I'm a prospective purchaser of the, uh, a unit in the P&D. I strongly support the proposal, and it's, to me, I'm very impressed with all the work that the college, the design team, and the village staff, and the village's consultants have done. It's just exemplary. Uh, with that said, as they say, I do have a few questions. And I would beg indulgence because I'm going to need more than three minutes. Okay, well, we'll see. So, following up on the solicitor's uh, comments regarding the CCRs, it's uh, uh, my understanding that this is a draft and that there have been discussions with the village uh, staff about this being structured as a condo rather than a planned community. And I wanted to make sure that there was where the condo association was responsible for the maintenance of common elements and everything else. And I wanted to make sure that that was, my understanding was correct regarding the condo, converting this to a condo rather than a planned community it doesn't pose any problems with the village. Well, go ahead. I mean, we we listen to your time and then we respond okay. if okay. necessary. Okay. The uh, second, and this is to uh, to the council's point about adding as a condition the village uh, uh, council and uh, uh, manager reviewing the CCRs. What would be the timeline in order for a revised draft to be submitted so that we don't impede things. The reason I'm asking this is there have been conversations between me and other uh, prospective owners and the college staff about getting prospective owner input into these documents at the stage before they're recorded. So I'd like to understand what the timeline is and uh, on that regard. With respect to the final review, I'm very interested in whether what, besides the ones that Council mentioned in terms of that long-range view, what the particular concerns the village uh, staff would have during the course of this review approval process regarding what they might be required or objected to in the CCRs. As was previously discussed and disclosed, the college is proposing to retain ownership of the land and it's be subject to a forever renewable 99-year lease. Uh, council mentioned uh, a lump sum lease. That's not my understanding of how this has been discussed. My understanding is that there will be monthly rental attached to, to this. And my question becomes, does the village have any concerns or requirements regarding a lease? in the picture here. And so, there's three minutes. May I continue? Um, so can we answer those questions and then? Well, uh, perhaps if, if you could find out how many, yeah. how much more he's got and then come take a beat on that. I mean, I guess like I'd, I'd like to check in how, how much of the, um, these sorts of questions are we really supposed to be looking at as planning commission? Well, I, mean, I can answer all of the questions so far. Okay. Okay, keep going. Okay. The, I personally have been lobbying the college for covered parking. The reason is that the group is primarily older, there's snow in the winter, and I, for one, don't want to shovel out my car. I, do that already and it's too much. And my question on that is, are there any village requirements or concerns with respect to covered parking that's not on the 
plans that have been submitted so far. Uh, Commissioner Donnell, I believe, raised the access. I support having access from the parking area to the alley and, ex and egress. And so my question on that is, are there any village concerns or requirements about shifting that, those waste enclosures left or right to enable that access? On, to the right is a, one of those bump out rain areas, rain gar garden areas. To the left, it looks like they could be moved. I did not see any provisions in the plan for recycling collection or composting equipment. And I'd like to know if there are any village requirements or concerns regarding locating and having recycling collection facilities and composting. On utilities page C004, <coughs> the page that purports to have all the utilities laid out, I did not see any reference to uh, electric or cable TV, and I'm wondering, I'd like to see underground utility. It, it's required, the draft, it, it the current is. draft yeah. has that. It's also a village requirement. It's a village requirement, yeah. excellent. It's a non-issue. The, um, I gather that there's no village requirement for fire suppression sprinklers in this project. And my question is, is that I've asked about that for my own unit. Is there any, are there any village requirements or concerns of a sprinkler system is in fact installed in, a, in one or That would units? be a building department. Yeah, we, we're, we're zoning, that would be building. So that's a Green County yeah. issue? Yes. Hey, let me answer that for you though. If you provide a sprink, you don't, if you're not mandated and you do provide it, it must meet all of the Ohio Building Code requirements for a supervised sprinkler system. But there are not, rec there really are sprinkler systems designed for residential use that are very simpler, simple, they run off the domestic water, um, and the building code says you can do them whatever you want. Excellent, thank you. With respect to the fire lane, there's been a little bit of discussion on that. By my calculation, using my thumb, <laughs> it's about 80 feet long on the public way. I'm talking about the front one. <coughs> and I'd really be very interested to know what the basis is for that very large <coughs> fire lane because I'm not anticipating that there's going to be a fire in these buildings. And if there is, it's one of those, like the flood waters, the 100 year thing. It's going to be very rare. And does that mean we have to leave that space open, unobstructed, put a vehicle in there to load or unload, and you get a ticket? So that's a, that's like to understand why it's so big, especially because the fire trucks could pull down the alley to the west and pump all their water in from the alley. And the last one was the, on paragraph J2, page nine of, of the zoning administrator staff report, uh, I would be very interested to know if a shared community structure to store association owned equipment for example, a big barbecue, a garden equipment or other stuff, whether that would be barred by the prohibition on privately held accessory structures. And those are my questions. Okay. Shall we continue for public comment or do you want to go address these? Um, we can go ahead and address these. Yeah, let's okay. go ahead and address these. Okay, I'll go ahead and start since I think the first few were uh, directed towards, uh, more towards me. Um, in the context of what do you call this document, whether it's a condo association, whatever the association is, that, that's, that's a term of, of art. Uh, the fund, fundamentally, there's going to be a document that governs the association that when this development is done, it will be an, the directors will be made up of the occupants of the eight units as defined by that document. So I'm not worried about what the title of it is. Um, the timeline to approve, I, I mean, that, that's really not on, this, not on this side of the desk, okay? The, the, if there's an, a, a conditional permit that's granted, then I think that that will be left in the hands of Denise uh, and me to the extent that I need to be involved or the manager or, or village, I'll say loosely village staff, and that timetable will be done with 
But your review and Patty's review is not going to tie it up for a month. Right. I mean, it's it, yeah. it, it's. I mean, it's just a review. It will be it will be reviewed uh, in, in in an expedited, appropriate manner because we know that you want to move forward. I mean, the way we would any process anything. Well, I, I, my question wasn't clear. Let me clarify okay. that. The question is, what what can't happen until this document is approved? In other words, can they? put out for uh, bid their construction cost estimates? Can they get building permits? Can they? I think you should direct that to, towards your project manager. And, um, and the answer is, is that there, both sides will have to do things, and it's a process. I mean, Ted, maybe you can weigh in on it, too. But I, um, yeah. to look to us to say, what's the timeline? No. We're not the right people to ask that answer that question. I'm not, I'm asking. My concern is to understand and not cause delay. And so the, with respect to, and to have as much time as possible to have back and forth and to get a good set of documents together. With respect to condo versus plan community, with all due respect, they're not the same. They're covered by different state laws. In the, and condo association specifically recognizes a condo property can be on a night forever renewable 99 year lease and a planned community has no such recognition. There is a difference. It's not just nomenclature. And the con so there's going to be some discussion and some back and forth. And what my concern is, is that, well, we can't go forward with what, whatever X is because the village or somebody else won't let us go forward absent having approved CCRs. And that's what I'm trying to understand. Uh, we're looking the, to, go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, it, with regards to the building itself, um, you can submit plans to Green County building regulation for a building permit without the zoning permit. They're gonna ask for it, but you're gonna have to provide it by the time you pick up your building permit. Plans, I, I think there's enough documentation in these plans to date to be able to solicit to get bids, but that's not on us, certainly, that's on your side of the table, but um, there's nothing as far as building are concerned that would delay anything. So um, you're Relative to the conditional use, this planning board will put forth a list of conditions that, need, that we, as a board, vote on and have consensus towards um, being the condition for the zoning permit. Those conditions, whether this side of the table wants to agree with that, pull back on the project, take design time to address is is totally on you. But as effective as of the end of tonight, well, you'll know up or down where we stand with the zoning. Well, so, I think he's asking about, so if we, if our council approves the um, covenant or whatever um, uh, with the, with Antioch, at that point, there's no changing it. Right. So that's the timeline question that you're having is, at what point do prospective buyers get to be part of that conversation? And I think the answer is, as, as soon as Antioch lets you be part of that conversation, then you get to be part of that conversation, but it's not the village, like, this is the process that we have. It does need to be approved because we need to have reviewed whatever agreement is is happening over a long period of time. Um, and if, if that were to be changed by Antioch, Antioch would have to come back to the village about, about that, and I guess, like, and we won't get into specific language regarding the agreement, the covenants and restrictions. What we look for, what the solicitor work looks at, is to make sure that the, that the village is protected in the case of a default of that association. What's going to happen if that association goes belly up or decides to dissolve, which we won't let that happen, but if that association does not maintain the ground, how is the village going to address that lack of maintenance? Well, we need a party to go after to charge 
to do that maintenance on behalf of that association. So, so that's have, what we look for. If you have issues with how it's written now, you wouldn't go to the village, you would go to Antioch. Correct. Mm -hmm. no, that, yeah, please accept okay. my apology for not being clear. Let me try one more time. And that is, <coughs> that is, I understand there can be a vote tonight and it can be subject to the draft CCRs being revised and submitted for re approval by the zoning administrator, the village solicitor, and the village manager. And then once that's approved, then something can happen, like issuing a zoning permit. And you can't do something else, like get your building permit, until you have your zoning permit. Yes. So they can't get the building permit, but they can do everything, but they could submit their application to get the building permit. It's just the permit, building permit won't issue until the zoning permit's in hand. Is that what I'm correct. hearing? Yes. That is correct. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your indulgence. That's okay. I mean, the, the two conditions that I'm going to recommend to Planning Commission are that the covenants be approved by village staff, and the other one is, is that um, there be in the declarations a phrasing that says essentially that the association cannot be terminated without village approval. Those would be the two recommendations that I have. There were a couple that. questions that... Anybody else want to come up for citizens' comments? But, so what about my other question? Well, the, I, I can answer these. The, the monthly lease is not a village concern. This is a private development. They get to do whatever they want. Okay. The, the only relevance to that is how that would fit into the declaration. As it pertains to covered parking, recycling plan, uh, fire suppression systems, uh, some things related to the fire uh, lane, uh, shared community structure, I think that that's incumbent upon the, the, the project to, developers to come here and talk to Denise about that that's you, you've raised those concerns but we're not the ones who make that decision talk to talk to the folks from Antioch right the, the question is when talking with the fo folks at Antioch do they have to if they want to agree to put covered parking does it come back to the village it, <coughs> does yeah. the yes so yes. whatever vote has happened, there has to be another review. There needs to be content. There needs to be consultation with Denise, as the zoning administrator, who will then have a dialogue with the group. Uh, and if it's, and I can guarantee you, if the planning commission votes to approve this with conditions, that Denise will be motivated to work with the, the Antioch team to move this project along in an expeditious manner. And can the zoning administrator sign off on this thing, or does it have to come back to the commission? I can meeting. sign off on yeah. covered parking. I just want to make sure that, you know, it's going to be yeah. technically pleasing. Yes, and of course. It's of course. not going to, yeah. There, 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 could, there could be some chance, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, this, but there no. could be some reasons why. <laughs> We're not I, I can't think of what they might be now, but we may have to come back to planning commission. But it, fundamentally, it, once it leaves today, yeah. if, if everything runs smoothly, then you'll yeah. be dealing with Denise. And There's no removal stuff. of the common areas pathways and parking is going to be a responsibility of the association absolutely i understand that yeah and i'll be paying maintenance fees for that so, um okay. any other so much. citizens really comments your call. i just first want to say how excited i get emotional <laughs> and that this is happening I didn't, I didn't think it was ever going to happen. It's been five years. It will be five years next month that we've been trying to get something off the ground. So, so it's very exciting to me, and I'm, I'm looking forward. Anyway, I'm sorry I'm emotional. <laughs> but anyway, but another but a concern I have, and, and I would want it to be in the record, because I know your concern about the CCRs are how they affect the village. My concern about the CCRs are how they affect us. And I, I want you to hear this because we are putting, the uh, purchasers are putting a lot of money in to buying a house on leased land that is owned by the college. And we 
as purchasers, and I get this all the time, how are we protected if Antioch folds? It is a very important question to us, just as you are very concerned about the other aspects of getting your needs met. The only way that we can, well, the best way that we can be protected is to have a condo association because it's the only organization that deals with a 99-year lease. And no matter what happens to the college, that lease has to be, has to continue on and it, everything is in the provisions to do that. These CCRs do not address that. And they address a whole lot of things that we're not even in, that, that are problems for us. So it is very important for us that the college and us work together to get the best kind of CCRs that not only address your needs, but also address our needs. And I want that in the record because it's so important. And, and what I would say to that is, I'm sorry, is that if any potential, and I will call the, the buyers, have the power to have their own attorneys review that. That's not a village responsibility. Right, and we do have one. And, and whether we call this, to address Mr. Huff's point, condo association, there isn't a, going to be an association of some form, but until I know exactly how the, the, the intention is, I mean, I, I wasn't sure if this was ownership, leasehold, and these are all things that I'm learning. So we'll get the right type of association and we'll work together collaboratively on that. And it sounds as if the potential people who are going to be living there have some input in that, which is great. Um, and we'll see how it plays out. I'm getting over some balance issues, I hope. Um, I'm very excited about this. It's been a dream of mine to live in a sustainable community. I'm sorry, Sylvia, can you give us your name, please? I'm Sylvia Carter Denning Miller. Those are all my names except for the Miller. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> means trees. Sylvia means trees. And that's what I'm for. However, I'm not for, for rain barrels that I have to control. I don't want that battle. I don't want floods. Had enough of that. I don't want red every day. I don't have control of the climate, but I do have control of what I buy. And I have some aesthetic concerns because I notice that the pictures I have are all in lush green. And I'm not a young person can live for the growth of trees that big. And I'm not interested in living in something that looks like a Kwanzaa either. So, but these look very nice and they look, you know, I hope that they could look cozy before, <laughs> before long. <laughs> And uh, um, I'm concerned about a surface that might be permeable to water, because there are such things, and we know people who have them here in this village. So I would wish for that, and that would take care of our, some of our stormwater problems. I'm con concerned about we all should need solar. I don't think I, that's not part of my, my ideal community, that we choose whether we have solar or not. This is supposed to be a sustainable community, and that's what I want it to be. And I, I, I agree with people's comments. I think they're also very valid. Um, let me see, I don't think I have anything else to, to say about this. The storm, oh, I know what it is. I ha built a house with my husband, and we knew about, the architect knew about storm water. He knew about overhangs. He knew about how to direct that into French drains all the way around the house. And that was working like this. This I do not get like the water comes down here, right? Got that, everybody? The water comes down here, and it comes out there, and it comes out there. Now, I don't get where it goes then. So those are the things that are not answered to my happiness, okay? I think that's about all I have to say. Thank you so much for all the work, and thank you so, for, so much for your continued attention to this. And I love the questions, thank you. I don't have to make as many. Thank you. <laughs> Sylvia and, and others, thank you very much. But I really do want to underscore that the, the concerns that you're bringing up are not up to us. That's not They're not up to us. And so, I mean, I think philosophically, we probably are all for permeable surfaces. I think you could tell that we have a shared concern about water drainage. But um, that's not something that this body is saying 
any, you know, so, Annie, you know, you must do this or we're not going to vote for it. I mean, it's something that has to be worked out with Antioch. Can I, can I address that real quickly? Please. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Hmm. Hi, I'm Steve Lyle. I'm from the Ranky Group. I'm an uh, engineering consultant on the project. And I thought maybe I could just give you a brief overview of how the stormwater works. So they're going to have some gutters to collect the water, but it will be directed with probably under drains, but we have to work out the details, to the rain gardens. And then the rain gardens are going to hold water. It's sized for the, for the impervious surfaces, okay? And they're designed to infiltrate if we, we have the proper soils for that. You know, we might have a little bit too much clay. But um, in the case we have too much clay, we'll have an under drain under there. We'll have a combination of certain soils and mulches that will soak up some of that water and plantings that will help soak up the water. And then it's directed to a bioswale on the other side of the parking lot, which has permeable parking areas. So. The, the lane that comes in for the trash is not. That's heavy duty because we'll have trash trucks coming in there. But where you park will be permeable. So that's, that's supposed to allow infiltration there. And then it will all eventually feed on the east side into a bioswale that will infiltrate into the ground. And you know we still have to do some soil borings to make sure, like I said, the soil's suitable. But uh, that's the concept, that we capture all the water on the site and adjust for the uh, impervious surfaces and allow that water to get back in the ground. So we're trying to do that. Anyway, that's, that's the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. All right. Uh, if there are no other comments, I'm going to close the public hearing, um, bring it back up here. Um, okay. Um, I, I just want to review. Um, some of the recommendations for a uh, condition and see if we, everyone agrees with these or not. I feel they've already been covered. Um, one of the, which we really didn't talk about, and uh, Christian's still on the phone. I'm still here. You're still there. Okay. Um, Thank you. He did, he, um, in the parking lot requirements, it's an 18-foot stall. Um, he has changed that to be an 18-foot. I don't think it showed on the on the site plan that I had. Or did you decide that you were going to give you gave an explanation as to why you wanted to not have all of it be uh, asphalt? Can you just kind of explain that verbally? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I sent over in narrative format in the, uh, the memo that had followed last week's meeting the uh, explanation as to the, the thought process behind not having a fully paved 18 foot long stall, and I'm but rather I'd put having that in there. paving only. Yes, um, and instead uh, going with a, a 16 feet of paving and then utilizing the permissible two foot overhang to allow for the landscape to get closer to the permeable uh, asphalt of the parking stall itself. So by doing that, it, what we're doing is the, the portion of the car that's overhanging where the wheels will stop at the six inch curb um, we're bringing landscape as close to that as possible so that way, for example, on the east side, we're able to get closer to a seven foot wide bioswell instead of a five foot wide bioswell, which would allow for, allow for the bioswell to be able to function properly and have the appropriate slope and depth to be able to better infiltrate the, uh, the stormwater. The, the uh, zoning ordinance, and, and forgive me if I misinterpreted this, uh, but there's a provision in the uh, the zoning ordinance that allows for a up to a two foot overhang if it's for the stall. Let's see, it's, I'm looking at the the portion of it right now. So it's in 1264, and it's part. The space length may be reduced by up to two feet if it's unobstructed overhang, such as a landscape area or sidewalk, is provided. 
Um, so we're, we're trying to take advantage of that portion to, again, cut down on the amount of paving. And although it's, it's porous asphalt, it's a permeable surface, the more that we can cut down on it, the, the better um, in that regard. And instead, redirect it towards the areas that would be of a better benefit. You'll probably notice that it's a 10 foot wide stall instead of the minimum nine foot. That's allow for doors to be able to swing fully open and easier access in and out of cars. Uh, that, that's the standard width of a uh, accessible uh, parking stall. So we want to redirect whatever kind of uh, paving services we were using to facilitate where the people would be having better access to their cars and then be able to landscape the rest of it. So if I misinterpreted that two foot permissible overhang, um, we can definitely go back and, and revisit the design um, to evaluate, but we were trying to utilize that as, as a means to bring in more landscaping and a better, more viable bioswell along the east side. How about putting four of those parking spaces parallel in the alley on the west side and getting rid of that whole row, and then you've increased your bioswale? Uh, four of the parking spaces along, we're talking about the parking spaces along the east uh, side of the parking lot? No, I, I'm trying to figure out a way to utilize that alley. <clears throat> and I think that if you parallel park on the west alley, parallel parked four spaces that were close to those west units, you would accomplish your goal relative to sustainable issues and then make that alley more uh, utilizable by public services and other things, and I'll get into reasons why I think that's important. I think it could become part of a fire lane. I think it would be a better avenue for refuge collections, things like that. But the alley is really underutilized, and we would like to see it more utilized. But that would give you more space on the east side to increase your bioswale. And get people closer to their unit. Mm -hmm. Just a suggestion, but that sticks with me. And and that kind of change is allowed as long as would that kind of change have to come back to us? Um, at this point, I don't think if yeah if it's incorporated in uh, if they are still meeting the needs and you know, okay. I can approve that if they want if they want to change it if they don't want to change it um, so we don't own that alley it would have to obviously the give parking us would be on your side okay it's access otherwise you're just taking the alley oh the so you're saying the parallel par parking the parking you're saying it would still be on the property mm -hmm. right. you're not suggesting it's in the alley right. yeah Correct. yeah right. got it. Ted, so, what, so I'm clear. What you're saying is, so we've already got a, a alley, even though it's not in any use. It's but it lets you utilize that, which is your comments from the beginning. Yes. Okay. And I also think in the northeast, the northwest corner of that alley would be a better location for the um, the refuge collection. That way mm -hmm. the truck goes, literally goes okay. down the alley, one direction picks up that whole neighborhood and doesn't have to go into the dead end of the parking lot. There's some so trees. Sorry, I'm just right. looking up the information yeah. real quick. So we can go uh, from uh, Davis <coughs> Street to Davis Street. Yeah, yeah. 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 Davis Street entrance, pick it up and then head out East North College or vice versa. Yeah. They're doing it now because there's yeah. houses. There's that, houses back there, right? Yeah, right. there's collection all the way down that alley. Yeah. 
Thank you for that suggestion. So just to be clear, if we were to explore that uh, further, that would just be something that we would review with Denise. Yeah. On, okay. Design with that. Okay. Now, is, is how do you feel then about the, the I mean, they basically, they do have 18 foot stalls, but they're not all asphalt. In my experience, the 18-foot stalls, even with a bumper block, are recommended because of lawsuits created because a guy who's maintaining the lawn and his weed whacker takes the finish off the bumper of the car that he's trying to weed whack underneath. So we have found, at least in my history, but I do much more commercial and certainly it's not sustainable um, stuff, but that seems to always be a rub. So, you know, whether you guys have, if the residents don't care if their cars are whacked up with a weed whacker and go for it, you know. <laughs> I don't think that we necessarily care. If it's not a public, if it was a public parking lot, it'd be different. But since it's a private parking lot, we're not going to have a big say. And Christian, can you speak to the, the plants that would be there? I don't know that we would be actually weed whacking or mowing right up to that curb well the plants if the plants grow higher than a bumper you know then the tendency yeah. is that people pull up to the plants mm -hmm. and you're losing your aisle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or they run over the plant you know I mean you know it's just it's a functional it's territorial for the mm -hmm. plants and the car mm -hmm. you know I think the plants should win <laughs> <laughs> and with all this rain, they will. <laughs> I think they should all be golf carts, for that matter. But you know, I mean, hey, that's a good suggestion. <laughs> but okay, that's so why the, that's why our ordinance is yeah. written away. Yeah. Thank you that. for that. So um, I think what we'll, on the we'll get a new set of clear plans with better markings of some of these things, like the rain barrels. Right, thing. right. And then, or at least a key mm -hmm. shows us where they're mm -hmm. at. And then um, the addition, the fire lanes, maybe be able to see where that location is. It needs to be moved over more towards the, that area, which is the plaza, which probably would be an area you wouldn't want cars to park in front of anyway, mm -hmm. because you're going to have right. um, that be the garden area as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, the final stormwater calculations um, are going to be provided upon um, completion of the construction plans of the village um, uh, public works director, director and the contracting engineer will review that. Um, and then um, Johnny Burns also asked if he wants to look at the construction plans mm -hmm. um, just to make sure for the uh, utilities, at least the utility plans. <clears throat> as well before <clears throat> at the same time they're submitted to Greene County for the building permits. Okay. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we also want to have a condition of the, uh, the final approval of the CCNRs um, uh, by, reviewed by the village solicitor and village manager and then um, making sure that the, uh, uh, they won't be able to cancel it without the village all springs agreeing to let it dissolve. I think we should throw in a comment about um, community storage buildings that might work with a refuge collection center, but there are going to be things that um, I don't see any accommodation for community storage. And that is something that if, if you want to at some point have, you can, but they have to be commonly. Um, you can't mm -hmm. have an accessory structure privately, okay. um, but you can have it as a as a shared. Okay. You're going to need it. I mean, mm -hmm. no. no question about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I would love and to just see to that. quickly note, the, uh, the units themselves also have an outdoor storage uh, closet mm -hmm. at the, on the back deck for each of the individual units for mm -hmm. any kind of outdoor storage, but uh, Correct. There, there's no individual uh, accessory unit or collective uh, community uh, storage or outdoor care. Movement. Uh, right. I did see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just part of the house. Um, and then I guess uh, we'll 
we'll just need to have those elevations in the gutters and yes. more visible on the site plan too. So those are the conditions that we've talked about tonight. What about the per performance guarantee? Did well, I don't know if that's, if that's something that needs to be done. I've never, huh? haven't, I have no experience with that. With what, I'm A sorry? A performance guarantee? Um, I'm not sure that we would require one on a residence like this on a small scale residence, okay. I okay. can't imagine. Okay. Um, I would also suggest that if the alley is being utilized um, to be able to go to the fire department and ask Colin if that alley can't be the other fire lane and get rid of the one in the front, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then I think, again, because of the resources that the college has regarding design, if you could look at a way to boulevard that portion of North College, mm -hmm and integrate it into your second phase. Um, we have a tree committee in town that'll plant trees. Mm -hmm. If there is some utility project that the, you know, or a resurfacing project that needs to go mm -hmm. on, it would be an opportunity for the village to follow that plan, plant those trees, do those boulevards mm -hmm. as a part of that. But I would love to be able to, to force that into the documents um, to break down that 75 foot thing driving mm -hmm. nuts. I mean, we're going to have a plane yeah. landing. Or something okay. in <laughs> <laughs> but that's not really a condition we can put on this. We can you ask know? them to address the design aesthetic of the treatment of the street and the pedestrian access from one side to their phase two. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can do that. So to do a proposal, a design proposal for it, not necessarily a requirement for it, but to yeah, do I mean, yeah, yeah your landscape designers. And I think we all agree, right? We all agree, yeah. right, Christian? Yeah, we all agree about that. It's well, it gives a tree committee. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's they're running out of memorial tree locations. So. Yeah. Oh, that's great to. I mean, that's great to hear. And we agree that it um, needs to be a little more pedestrian friendly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you do it, you're going to put the crosswalk where you want it and how you want it. If the village does it, it's going to be by some guy like this over here. <laughs> um, so uh, are we ready to hear a motion? Um, are we going? Are we going to make a condition about removing the asphalt on the adjacent property? I think that's I think that's really important. I mean, I was I I find it convincing that if there's already going to be heavy equipment on site, it's not that big of a lot. That it's it's an important it's an important thing to do. Is is that lot being rezoned as well? No. That's staying. So let me explain. I don't think that we let can me, condition. Let me just say one thing about with, with conditions that I've done with in the past with people. Um, because you can't hold up the process of still going forward. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll go ahead and approve the zoning permit for them mm -hmm. to keep going. But then they have to sign a letter of agreement um, outlining all of those conditions. If those conditions aren't met, then that gives us something to go, to go back to them on that you, you, know, you needed to take care of this, you said you would, so. Right, so we're not trying to hold anything up. No, we're we just trying to be um, forward thinking. And also um, make sure that our conditions are met because you know, if we were just to approve the permit um, at this point, even with those conditions, you know, the building department's not required to check that you're meeting all of those conditions. So as long as you know, our staff has a way to uh, make sure that those conditions are met. Um, that's, that's the letter. You know, to throw something in there as a strategy for you guys to consider when you're letting out the bid is to uh, designate that broken up pavement area as the site staging for the trailer, the portalettes, mm -hmm. equipment, heavy trucks, material storage. And then when the project is done, that they restore it to uh, grass or seeded, a seeded lawn. Yeah, but I don't think we can require that. I was just suggesting okay. them when yeah. they negotiate their contract. Well, we that was really, great. That's yeah. somebody, something the potential residents could discuss with the That's developer. Right. <laughs> 
Can you require something for the adjacent property? I'm just I don't think sure. so. No. No. We, we're unwilling to go there. <laughs> Although, although we know what we would like, <laughs> you know, what, what we should have done just in retrospect, when we rezoned this lot and this lot was divided yeah. with the other lot, we could have had that condition on that approval. It's not done yet. You know, for the rezoning. Yeah, but council could do that. It's not done yet. Yeah, it's not. Hmm. Well, it's something to consider. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think for everybody's sake, it's just not that much money. I mean, it, it, yeah. to not um, have the college go ahead and jump in there and do it. Right. Well, we do it. The rezoning's got to go for a second read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Until we can put it in there. Yeah, so council can put that in there. Right. Mm -hmm. Monica, yeah. you may want to talk to Denise about okay. that because we've got a council meeting on Monday. And it, and it would be nice if we could wrap that up because I, I won't speak for Lisa, but Council yeah, no, discuss I'm, yeah, that. Yeah, I would like to be involved in that conversation. And, and I think we um, can find a solution. I think we agree, too, this, that yeah. that concrete pad isn't desirable to look at. And I agree with you. It's seeding it, um, at least getting it back to green space. I mean, whether your great ideas rose about putting the pathways in there, whether we can commit to that, because of course yeah. we don't know yet what we're going to do. We're just sort of holding that space. So in the meantime, let's make it a green space, yeah. right? I completely agree with that. So I think it's just a matter of what, what do you need from us to say, okay, we're willing to do that. We, of course, don't want to hold up the zoning or the process. If you would communicate with Denise, and then because then we would need to make a slight change to the ordinances drafted, and we would need to get that to Judy by Friday at noon. Mm. So that, is that right? Thursday, 5 o'clock. Thursday. Thursday, 5 o'clock. <laughs> okay, we even have an earlier deadline. See if that's something that everybody's agreeable. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so um, do, do we need to go over the conditions again? I would like to go over them again. Okay. Okay, so. Um, A deviation from the parking lot requirements of the zoning code, um, and if if the alley is being utilized, um, we want to see if uh, that would be okay for Colin to get rid of one of the uh, fire lanes. Um, we're accepting the deviation of the parking. Is that correct? Okay. Um, <clears throat> removing the asphalt on the adjacent property, we'll, we'll put that with council yeah that's the so we got the deviation from the parking lot requirements of the zoning code we there you're agreeing that they're you're okay with that um the uh, fire lanes we're going to see about the alley being utilized the final storm calculations upon completion of the construction plans uh review of the construction plans by the public works director prior to or at the same time they're going to Greene County. Um, and final approval of CCNR is reviewed by the solicitor and manager. Um, and also um, we could just change that to village staff. Okay, just then village staff. With the agreement uh, the HOA not terminated without village approval. Oh, the association. The association, HOA. Um, and then there was a thing about with within the future phase um, to have the, the design aesthetics from the street uh, provided for phase two. Could, could in, you? in my notes, I had something about the elevations of gutters, oh, rain yeah. barrels, and drains, and something about the commonly owned storage. Um, but maybe we were was, drifting off condi yeah, conditions. I, think, yes. uh, I did have that. Um, let's see. How am I going to say that? Um, okay, so. We just, uh, this, 
site plan review to incorporate the, the, the elevations, the showing of the gutters, um, labeling of the rain barrels, and I'm curious as a question, how much are the rain barrels used with all these native plants? I mean, does ever, do you need eight rain barrels for domestic or for irrigation? The rain barrels uh, currently are paired up where they have a close proximity to the front and the rear deck planter boxes. Okay. Um, okay. So it's, it's not so much the capacity being driven by the the amount that's needed for those planter boxes, but rather convenient to, and to really convenient for the resident. That's cool. The access. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Um. How did, did we talk about the uh, moving the parking over to the alley and moving the refuge collection over to the alley, including it perhaps with a common storage building? How did the board feel about that? Do we need to include that? I thought that was decided that if they could do it, they could talk to Denise. That oh. Denise could approve that. Okay. Is that right, Denise? Yeah, so yeah. we would approve the plan as it is, but recommend a change okay. without condition so they could go swing either way yeah. what yeah that makes sense to me. Have, is that okay to do without I mean that alley would have to be improved to the extent that it could handle a fire truck well it handles garbage trucks right now you know and I would venture to say that given the location of the hazards which are those garages the fire department's going to go down that alley anyway I mean there's Five of them down there. It's just something you have to check out. Yeah. You know, and and you know, I go back to the same thing that you know, as far as a a planning commission, we have the charge of trying to restore the alleys, right? And and the the opportunity to restore those alleys is when there's a new development opportunity that is that is adjacent to those amenities. Yeah. Here we are. So if, if we don't do that, we're just going into kicking the can down the road, and I just don't want to be there. I yeah. think we really want to push that. It is, yeah, it is the village's responsibility to maintain that. So what does that mean, that the village might have to repave it? Or stabilize the base, put down some more gravel, make sure that it's clear, things like that. I mean, there's currently a garden and a car in that alley, so I think there's some right work that has to be done on the village's part to to make that accessible for us to consider it. Yeah, that that garden is the owner of that property was here at the last meeting of the rezoning, and um, they agreed that they would you know move that back so it's not encroaching anymore. But again, that's the area that we're talking about is the is the. North yeah, the, to south on yeah. the west side. We're talking more so than the more okay. so than the yeah. this alley here. See, I'm, I'm suggesting that a storage building refuge collection be here and this alley be maintained in four park, parallel somewhere. parking spots here. Get rid of these mm -hmm. and move slide everything down a few feet to accommodate that, still get the path in so that they can access mm -hmm. the cars. And then that gets rid of this allows you to expand this and move this over slightly to get more rain garden. Thank you. Yeah. And it does, um, like you said, it already has the uh, room for trucks go through there now. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah, that way a refuge truck isn't going down your lane, yeah. dumping, yeah. We, you know, we don't have you know just your containers, yeah, so you're just going down the alley, waking everybody up at once. Okay, so do we have a motion um, with the conditions as outlined to ap approve or? I move approval with the <laughs> conditions that Denise outlined. Yes. I second. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just have some faith in the conditions as out, mm -hmm. outlined for it, and Denise and I are gonna have to uh, run through those with a fine tooth comb. But we've got it on we've got it on video, so we should yeah. be able to do that just fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Styles. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Dinell. Yes. Doden. Yes. Pelzel. Yes. Lisa, so you know that if this ever were to come back to Planning Commission, you're now stuck on this board for the entire part of this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Marianne didn't hear the first part, although I will say that in the past, if, if the absentee if, person watches the old tape, yeah. then they, they can see I, that. I am a neighbor. I live on Livermore, and I'm glad to be involved through the duration. <laughs> You're not an adjacent neighbor because you don't have a conflict of interest right. in this issue. So. Yeah. No, I'm not an adjacent neighbor, but I, I do care. We're all neighbors, really. Thanks for pointing that out. Just to clarify. Thank all you. All right. <laughs> I'm neighbor-ish. All right, thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, thank, you. thank you for all your great questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks, Good night. Good night. So, should I yeah, hang this up? Yeah. It should be an end call button. No, there's not. The two hours right. are right. End call button. Okay, <laughs> now we're not move finished. on to the next No, there's series. at least another two hours. <laughs> no, not the other two Because we've actually gone over all of this. Yeah, no, it's pretty so straightforward. It should be fast. I ended yeah. it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It was the easy part it's to read. It's our job, you know? Yeah, let's do it. I, I have to go work. Yeah, so. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. What did I you can tell you, though, I have five acres. And I have one fifty-five gallon And I rarely use it. When, when I have new planting. But basically, could you talk about planting natives? Um, I let it Maybe rain. we had a drought. We but still he's right. If you have things on a deck, I do have a drought. So, I mean, yeah. it's for a rain to save it for a not rainy day. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break. Oh, it is. But that doesn't mean you can represent yourself. Which in turn we're very fortunate to have so much water. Yeah, you represent yeah, yourself. Yeah. Um, no, but you're Well, but you're not pulling yourself up to be the attorney. And then but you I, have it away from the amount of water coming. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Where do you live in Chicago? I lived in Chicago for 12 years. Yeah. I. Yeah. I tell people that I grew up at Children's Memorial Hospital because I lived right there and I went to DePaul for it was my first degree and then worked for many years at Children's before and then we moved to Seattle. Yeah, until I know. Yeah, I know. It's hard for me to, I mean, I still am in touch with a lot of my former colleagues, and it's really hard to imagine that that's not there anymore, you know. Can we find out? What was your thought on me? You know, I was just thinking about, we were talking to a friend from Chicago about how great it was, you know, and like Wise Fools pubs, and all those, all those blues clubs that were there on Lincoln Avenue, and they're not there anymore. It's still a great city. Yeah, this house like, yeah. Once, I have been, yeah. what I thought <laughs> and what happened sometimes, yeah. and uh, we just got a message from the Public Commission on something. So are you, are you going to retire and, and move here, or, or move from Chicago, or are you going to be both places? Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah, so they can stay. Yeah. Uh, 
That's great. It's a nice place to live. We've been here 10 years. Uh, and and um, the, my PhD is from Antioch uh, no. University before the before the co college closed. So um, that's how I found Yellow Springs too. I was in the PhD in leadership and change. So so it's a it's a it's a multi system. So every every quarter. Essentially, at different points in the calendar year, we would come to Yellow Springs in the summer, and then Seattle in the fall, and then Keene, New Hampshire in the winter, of all places, and then Santa Barbara. So we would meet as cohorts from all around the country for two weeks at each of the camp campus campuses. And the library services came from New Hampshire, and the um, Lorian Alexander and Al Guskin, who you might know from the college, because he was the chancellor and president, Al Guskin. He was my professor, and he was one of the designers of the program. So um, it was a very, very cool program, very innovative. Yeah, well, it's nice to meet you. We'll be neighborish. So that means that I shouldn't attend even the meeting, or can I attend the meeting? Just not say anything or not vote. Let me clarify that, but I think that this. Judy, thank you for the nuts. Okay. That's why they all sit up there. Yeah. So I can sit and listen. I mean, you can make you the comment. I mean, you can make you the comment. 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 You can make you yeah, not every year like this you, you choose to come through your time and not public capacity. I don't know why that doesn't make any sense to me, but let me keep going about so yeah. you know, I remember Ted, sometimes he would have to recuse himself and he'd sit on the other side because he was like the architect of the project. Yeah. Well, and, and that's... Well, yeah. Well, yeah, and that, that's sort of my talk, that I feel like I would rather it not ever be called a question that it yeah. Well, in this body in particular, we have alternates for that reason. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, but I want to hear the definitive answer. So the October 18th meeting, would I say no attend that? Or could I probably participate? But I could attend, but just keep my mouth shut. If you're sitting down there, then you're commenting. Well, you know, it's, it seems like it'll be a lovely little, you know, space and manageable. Well, that's different than he, then I think that he, because he's employed there, uh, it's another, another layer. Yeah. Um, so but he, he was able to participate in other stuff. I mean, not in that. No, 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 not in that. But I mean, then he got up and finished the meeting. With yes. So I could do But the, no, I would the 18th is wow. just deal with. I would bring in the right. alternate for that. Oh, the eighth, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's, we're not dealing with, that's all yeah. we're dealing with. Yeah. So that maybe I should just not even come to that. Okay. I'm going to grab this. I'll all right, leave. let's get this back going. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This cool? Well, when you move away, you move away from that to this, whoever gets that is going to be having a gym. Okay, let's get let's get moving. Okay. And it's just up here. That's true. Um, Denise, can, you need, you need me here for this mm -hmm. one. Okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Have a good evening. You can stay for the rest of the meeting if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Run fast. <laughs> All right. Okay. Call back. And, all right. See you. Bye bye. Good night, Chris. Good night. Okay, okay, so um, as you may have noticed in the minutes, I don't know how I made that mistake, um, we'd already approved the fourth and the fifth one down, 126002E and 126003A. Um, there was some noticing things, but you um, had clarified that in the motion, so we were good. <clears throat> so what we need to go through is 122611, 12, and 13. And then 126003B parking and storage. Um, I couldn't find where I had brought it back to you again after we had had the con conversation about it. And but um, 
<clears throat> we thought it would be good to still do it because it's also came up at uh, the last council meeting as well. So I think we should just start with the first one, 122611. Okay. Sorry, I have a nut in my mouth. Okay. Um, do you want to make any statements about these? How, how do you want to go through this? I can, I can do that. Let me get One at a time. Yeah, let me And then we can discuss it. Okay. And then vote. So, um, then vote. 1226.11, minor subdivisions. Um, there is a strike through on the council because there was nowhere else in the document where council ever needs to come for minor subdivisions. It doesn't have to get council approval. And we have discussed this already quite a bit. Yes. Um, we also made the decision that we're sh the, the planning commission, the recording in instrument, uh, be uh, submitted to the planning commission at least 20 days prior to a regular scheduled commission meeting um, in order <clears throat> for all the proper noticing can happen. Um, approval of a minor subdivision uh, with formal action by the Planning Commission shall be required in the following circumstances along with additional conditions. So if it's just a straight minor subdivision, um, it doesn't have to come before for you, uh, just on the regular um, consent agenda. But if someone decides to do a private street or an access easement or um, uses a, an uncommon lot configuration of like a 20-foot frontage, then that needs to come before the Planning Commission. So we have pr basically one, two, three, four um, have those additional uh, conditions. And I, as I mentioned, we've already gone through this quite a bit before, but I wanted to bring this back to you again because I didn't uh, <clears throat> notice 12, 26, 12, or 13, and those were going to be affected by it. So I thought, I'll just, at the last meeting, we just said, we'll just bring it all back. Okay. And I kind of took that in my mind as everything. But So I also attached with that the actual application for minor subdivision that we used, and I put that information into that as well. Nice. Okay. Um, all right, so that's 1226.11, minor subdivisions. Which now discussion? How about if we include 1226.11, 12, and 13 together, save a little time, because they all do relate. Okay, 1226.12 12 for replats. Um, the uh, approval of replat just basically, uh, if it's the same number of lots as in the original plat, no, no big deal. But if, uh, if, the if, if formal action, it, if it's going to involve a private street or access easement, then, uh, or again, the proposed replat has a minimum frontage of 20 feet available to access in the existing landlocked lot, then, then it's got to come before the Planning Commission. So it's the same sort of thing, same language, same language it's just a different, um, it's a replat versus a, a, a minor subdivision. And then I incorporated that into the replat application, that information as well, and that's attached at the back. And then the final thing um, is the subdivision fees. So I went ahead and put, you have your preliminary plats, your final plats. Under minor subdivisions, be, um, it's $50 for any new lot created. Um, and if the minor subdivision requires planning commission approval, then there's, <clears throat> I added the $100 planning commission fee for going through that process. Um, and then same for replats. Um, replats were only $10, so <laughs> they, they involve a lot of work, so I just bumped that up to $25. Um, and if the replat does require um, planning commission approval, then <clears throat> an additional payment uh, of the $100, which will help cover the cost of advertising it in the paper and sending out the notices and putting the sign up and all that. <clears throat> so that takes care of those three. Okay. Um. Well, we're going to, we, does anyone want to discuss it before I open it up for a public comment? No. 
Okay, um, I'm going to open the public hearing and now hearing no public comments, I'm going to close the public hearing um, and uh, bring it back up here. I'll motion that, that we accept um, chapters 12, 26, 11, 12, and 13 revisions as submitted. Second. Styles. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Donnell. Yes. Doden. Yes. Fozo. Yes. Well, that is going to definitely I would that we do change all the, the way sections together. It's going to really increase our infill yeah. and our housing stock. And I think okay. it's just been clarification of the code that just wasn't clarified before. I mean, it was actually a lot of this was in there. We just didn't yeah. realize it. So that's good. All right. So 1260. Oh, um, 2AE and 1260.03A was already voted on. So we're going to 1260.03B. Parking and storage. Okay, so 1260.03B, parking and storage. Um, We had A that we voted on. Yeah, and then there were the two that we oh, are skipping. It was actually C. Did I mess that up again? Okay, well, let's go. We're going to vote on this just with a change from. It should have been C for recreational vehicles. <clears throat> okay. So with recreational vehicle parking, we discussed with the police department, we talked to staff, we talked to the public works department, and agreed that um, parking um, recreational vehicles on any street, alley, highway, or other public place in the village um, should, not, should be prohibited except for quickly loading and unloading of the vehicle. Um, so in that we took out the using the same as a dwelling and took out the 72 hours uh, or the apparently there's something in another code in the police department's code that allowed um, parking for 72 hours yeah and and council's looking at that right now um, now this provision doesn't prohibit the temporary occupancy for periods up to 72 hours of a recreational vehicle provided that it's on a lot in a residential district. Now I understand that that kind of caused some concern at the last council meeting but I think that we should just so you're aware? I, yeah because yeah. I, I want I, I can comment on that. Okay. It didn't people weren't concerned it was just uh, to use a technical term smushed together in one paragraph that the first part is about parking on basically a public space mm -hmm. and but the second part is about parking it's when it's parked in a residential on the lot so the second part is about being on a lot not on the street and so that was the confusion so on one hand it's unlawful for any person to park or cause to be parked in any mobile home or recreational vehicle on any street, alley, highway, or other public place in the village. Um, it is legal to park your recreational vehicle on your own lot. Yeah. But we prohibit temporary occupancy for more than 72 hours. So that's where it was just confusing because. Yeah, and it's funny because um, that was that whole part of it was mm -hmm. always there right and we weren't actually that wasn't what our text amendment was about mm -hmm. um, all we were doing was taking out and to use the same as a dwelling on the street mm -hmm. and 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 just flat out saying except for loading and unloading period you just can't have it on the street right so I don't think there was any worry about it okay. it just took us a while to parse it okay because then we thought oh wait you can be in it and you can 
You can have it as temporary occupancy for periods of up to 72 hours if you're on the street. Oh, no, not on the street, on your lot. Oh, okay, so that's where the confusion, okay. All right, so because we, um, I, I, I had thought, what I, what I was told was that people were, well, why, why can't they part, live in the recreational vehicle on, on, on private property for? Yeah, Councilperson Hempfling uh, did express some concern that if, you know, why couldn't they? We didn't discuss that a lot. Um, I wondered at the time, although I didn't express it because we were running very long, if there may be issues about like fire code and I mean things like that that yeah. we don't really know. Right. Um, yeah, they don't have an occupation. Permit. Right. I mean, yeah. I figured there was probably Occupancy some reason, yeah. but um, yeah, and that is exactly that. They're not built the, the same. They're not code. built for that. Yeah. Yeah, um, they're just yeah. So that is the reason, and there's you know obviously. Um, it to be able to have an accessory dwelling unit, which could be a mobile home on a type of manufactured home on a property, it has to be connected to the utilities. Um, and there's other requirements for that, which we really got into a lot of detail on under um, manufactured homes um, in order to be a manufactured, in order to be accepted, it has to have like one of four requirements, one being that it's either been built in a HUD approved facility where they have a stable HUD inspectors, building inspectors that check on it, or it has to be certified by an Ohio professional design person, mm -hmm. or third, if it was coming from somewhere, somewhere else, else yeah. that it had to have a, a, mm -hmm. a previous uh, occupancy permit that had been granted. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Green County won't will never give them an occupancy permit. Yeah, and I think I think you're making a good point to differentiate between accessory dwellings and that aspect of our code and this that's really about recreational vehicle parking. Right. And yeah. one of the reasons that you put a time limit on it isn't necessarily to prohibit things for the citizens. This is to if somebody has a teenager who lives in the RV on the lot and is smoking dope and causing a lot of music and sound every night, mm -hmm. there needs to be something to force the homeowner mm -hmm. to evacuate that building for the neighbor's sake. Right. Well, that was the other but thing that was discussed. It's complaint. It complaint driven. It is. And then, yeah. and that was the other thing I think that Councilperson Hempling was talking about. Is it was this going to be like an? We're going like, to no. go and seek it out. But we were all saying, no, it's just if, if it's a problem. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah, it would be, it has to be complaint driven. Because mm -hmm. I had just, I had, did have somebody that asked me about one, about being able to park. I say, why? Is there, do you know of one? And they're like, well, no. Well, no, no. <laughs> so I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't want to. I said, okay, fine. <laughs> <clears throat> so that, um, uh, we want to make sure that goes on forward to council and then uh, the second part of that is the 126004A13 uses striking that driveway setback language which I believe we, we may have already done but we did not, um, I did not properly put the 126004H in the, in the correct place. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to make a new category rather than making it A14, it's, it's now H, uh, adding that cl clarifying language regard, regarding tiny homes. Mm -hmm. And it pretty much spells out with what you know. Mm -hmm. You can have it on wheels or not, but it has to be anchored uh, properly to the ground and then you have to have these other requirements of Green County. And we actually met with Al Kuzma Green County Building Regulations, and he was, yeah, I mean, it's just certain things will and certain things won't. And these these make out the criteria for that. So I think we've pretty much beaten this to death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So oh, we, we can. Okay, so I'm going to open uh, the public hearing. Can I open them all three mm -hmm. together? No, I, I, you don't like it when well, I do that. I don't like it when you do that. Okay. <laughs> It's a little confusing. Also, the re you were you did not miss notice this. The reason that the, the recreational vehicle parking was noticed as B is that there 
C would have been the previous one in the zoning code if anyone looked it up. So it's noticed as what it was, and you're making the change also to the lettering. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gosh. Thank yeah, it's you. the old you're lettering. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you for catching it. Okay. So. Okay. So, um, do you, do we need? Okay, so I'm going to open up uh, the public hearing for uh, Chapter Amendment 1260.03B, uh, Parking and Storage. Hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Do you want me to, do Do we want to do a motion now and then do the next no, one? No, yeah, do the motion and it's in, in your, okay. to, to Section B, which now becomes Section C. Which now becomes Section C. Okay. Prompt motion to approve changing the section B to C or whatever you just said. Um, Second. Dino? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Stiles? Yes. Doden? Yes. Pilsel? Yes. All righty. All right, now I'm going to, um, we've, we've discussed all of these. Yep. I think I'm um, going to uh, open the public hearing for the amendment to chapter 1260.04A. H. Oh, A. A13, striking driveway setback language for this section of the zoning code. Hearing none, I'm going to close the public oh, hearing. No, you got to open it first. Oh, I thought I did. Oh, did you? Yeah, that's oh. what I, that was the whole thing I just did. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Um, I'm going to close down. it. Do I hear a motion? I motion. move approval. Second. Stiles, Okay, Pilzell. Yes. Doden. Sure. <laughs> yes. Krieger. Yes. Denell. Absolutely. Stiles. <laughs> yes. We've been talking about this for months. All right, I'm going to um, open the public hearing for Chapter 1260.04H, um, adding clarifying language regarding tiny homes on wheels. Um, hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. I move that we add uh, 1260.03H regarding tiny homes. 1260.04H. 04H. Second. Thank you. Okay, how's that all? Uh, Krieger? Yes. Dinell? Yes. Stiles? Yes. Doden? Yes. Pelzell? <laughs> yes. Okay. Under right. business under agenda planning, um, there's going to be at the October 8th meeting. Uh, Wait a minute, we got old business. Uh, yeah, there's going to be October 8th, the regular planning commission okay. meeting. There's going to be a uh, conditional use hearing for a um, the the that uh, at the corner of Herman and Zena Avenue the home inc the dental office oh no oh. The, that old dentist office mm -hmm. that's been sitting there vacant and it's finally been purchased and it's going to be um, oh that's I'm going to do it under professional services to be an, an acupuncturist and a massage therapist. So that'll be coming on the 8th. Ted, do you want to talk about old business? Yes. Um, I have laboriously gotten through the putting the old comprehensive plan into the new index, and it's a mess. So <laughs> uh, it's going to take me a couple more weeks, but hopefully I'll have that done. Um, and I would also like to make mention that during the council meeting, there were three issues brought to council that Planning Commission doesn't know about. Those three issues are that the, the council commissioned staff to do a stormwater study, which directly affects our comprehensive plan. Um, it also commissioned to do an RFP for the electric distribution study, uh, which again directly affects our comprehensive plan. And to come to, to come to the land trust presented a plan uh, to council to prioritize properties that they wanted to go after and, and extend village monies to. Um, I think all three of those issues should have come to Planning Commission 
so that we had an opportunity to uh, put some conditions on maybe some of those things as we roll through our work as a commission. Um, for example, to come to land trust came with a single plan with the properties identified with no conditions, council approved that plan. Mm -hmm. Our conditions would have been this property is in two watersheds. One watershed is in the township, one watershed in the village. Um, from a development point of view, we don't want restrictions on that watershed that's in the village. And that is a negotiation tool for Tecumseh to deal with. Um, those are questions that planning commission ask and not council. And I think that, that there is a precedent being set by council to bypass planning commission on mm -hmm. issues. And it is, to me, detrimental to good, thoughtful investigation of why we do planning. That's our job, planning. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to beat council up, but it, it concerns me because we're going to get it dumped on us, already approved, and then if we have questions, it, it becomes a battle, mm -hmm. and we're going back through the back door. And I think it should be the other way. But that's just my personal thought. But those three things are, are critical to the comprehensive sure. plan. So, um, you know, I'm not always here, obviously. But I'm wondering, if, I mean, should that, should that have been triggered during agenda planning? Or when would that have been triggered so that you would have been able to say, hey, it should come to planning? I mean, council well, should bring it up. Right. Well, no, I think, Lisa, I think you're right about the trigger being agenda planning, and I'm wondering if um, maybe we could discuss with the village manager a mechanism whereby um, that that agenda planning piece rolls through. Well, it would be the planning commission chair just it rolls past to yeah. say there's nothing here of any concern to us mm -hmm. or boy you know can i'd like to check in and and i will let you know before you have to get this into the paper whether we'd like to have any input on this just some mechanism right now there is no mechanism and i don't think it's being done um uh, to purposefully snub planning commission mm -hmm. but oh, there good. has been precedent sent set and there just is no mechanism for that exchange. Mm -hmm. right? I, I like that idea and I think presumably <coughs> it could affect other commissions as well yes. because there's so much going on yeah. um, and I, I do think that uh, during agenda planning, it, you know, the pre-agenda planning that happens at the council table at the end of a meeting I think yeah. is the first trigger for the person who's the council liaison to say well, what, but, 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 yeah. right? Then the second trigger yes. could be when the preliminary agenda comes out for review. So, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to bring this up at, but, and, but I at will council. also say, and not to lay any kind of blame, because this is a complex, layered process, mm -hmm. but that probably a lot of that weight should fall onto the council representative mm -hmm. to that commission, because, and, and and maybe that needs some education around, here are the kinds of things that we'd like you to be looking for. These are the kinds of things we'd like to maybe see come past Planning Commission. Because I just, that's just not a piece that's yeah. been done. So, yeah. but I do think you're right, that should be the first trigger. Yeah, I think there has been a concerted effort to try to understand that. Mm -hmm. I oh, really I agree. Do. I mean, I think, but I mean, but then again, being able to have it Mm -hmm. really trigger in yeah. your mind so if yeah. you're at those meetings even you it might trigger you I'm not you right you have to be sensitized yes. and the other thing is and I am not making any excuse here but it's been my experience in the limited time I've been in council that by the time we're doing that last minute yeah. agenda planning we're like blah, 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 yeah. you know what I mean so it's, it's really we're not as focused at that moment I don't think we're as tuned in, and I think this is a, a comment that says, hey, we have to stay tuned in and really think about that, you know, and just stop and take a moment of silence and just say, is there anything that we're talking about that we think we need to run through one of our commissions? <clears throat> moment of silence. Let's think about that. Well, the well, difference between planning commission, though, and the other bodies is that we are a separate body set up by the state of Ohio mm -hmm. to protect the village interest against mm -hmm. the political entities, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. And as a result of that, we need to have a public forum 
to vet issues relative mm -hmm. to infrastructure and planning that council doesn't ha should really doesn't have time to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, we go. You can see how much right. depth we go into mm -hmm. when we have an application, and that's the way everything that comes before us goes. Council can't do that. So you know, mm -hmm. this is the forum to really get the public involved, mm -hmm. and it's what people look for when it comes to planning issues. And if it just goes to council and bypasses planning commission, it opens council up for a, a lawsuit mm -hmm. and challenge because it's not following protocol. Well, and with yes, and with everything that's going to be coming up with housing, oh yes, yes. it's going to be a lot. It so is. I think we have to be sensitive. Well, and the, so t then I'm going to put a little bit <coughs> also then back on planning commission because those agendas are there are future agenda items listed out every agenda, and I might suggest maybe you all want to have a subcommittee that watches those council agendas because it's really hard to know where the baton passes. Stormwater study sounds like a great idea, and boy, Planning Commission will be able to use this when it's done, instead of, hey, we want to be at the table for that because. So, I mean, that's the baton piece that if you guys have a subcommittee that's watching those agendas that can say, we want it on the front end instead yeah. of the back end so of there's this. So there's, sort of, there's three triggers. There's that future agenda listing that's always at the back that mm -hmm. has dates for future that you hope to accomplish them at some point. Right. Then there's the um, agenda planning where you could also trigger that as well. But then I guess also when you're at the beginning of your meeting, you can when you're reviewing your agenda, that would be another opportunity to say, oh, has Planning Commission seen this? Oh, well, maybe we don't want to even talk about this tonight till we've got that, till they've looked at it, because maybe we're not really ready. Mm -hmm. um, especially if it's so, if you have a full agenda, it gives you a reason to take one thing off your agenda for the night if it's not time sensitive. Yeah. Well, and, and, and quite honestly. Most city councils will do that anyway. If most city councils, if they get a planning agenda item on their agenda, mm -hmm. They kick it to planning commission for their review, and then it goes to council after they've reviewed it, not the other way around. Typically, I mean, in, at least in my career, that's the way it usually falls. Well, and one thing about watching the agenda that that can do for you, if you've got a subcommittee, is you can pick up the phone and call the village manager and say, "What exactly does this entail, and is this something we should be at the table for?" Because yeah. there, you may misinterpret something. I mean, that would just clarify yeah. that piece, and then that lets two of you do things that the entire body can't nimbly do it's just that's a thought yeah okay well, that's good well we've got an under agenda planning i think uh like i have uh the october 18th is just a work session without me with the hope that they come back november 12th this is for their this is not for the PND, this is for the PUD. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also going to be coming at some point for the PND as well. So they'll be going through the same process we just did with Antioch tonight. And so, Judy, will you let the alternate know then that he will need to come? I'm going to attend, but I'm going not okay. to. Okay. Okay. Um, Motion to adjourn. Second. We adjourn. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's great. Long meeting, but it's been great to be with you. I wish that I could be with you.